the agreement was not ratified, but both uh, sides uh, imposed sanctions uh, in, on the background of the EU criticism. It, there was also uh, the Hong Kong case. And finally, all of the problems between the EU and China, as perceived in China, namely uh, promoting own companies, not uh, letting the EU companies in on the Chinese market, not allowing for public procurements uh, by EU companies uh, acting against the World Trade Organization's uh, financing on players or subsidizing on players on the uh, international market so that they could uh, enter with their investments in on the EU market. It all taught the EU that the game between the EU and China is not the game where you can establish the rules as it used to be and uh, decide what they would be, create the links, the win-win uh, relations. Sometimes you can uh, criticize uh, the politics, but that was a real uh, competition of forces where the links and the relations are used as weapons. The Chinese uh, take advantage of the asymmetry of the links and then in the political uh, propaganda and cyber aggression as well as technological uh, dimension and most probably uh, in the military dimension, they build their advantage. Is the EU ready for such a diagnosis and for such a world? I would say that uh, defensively it starts to be ready and to build mechanisms to compensate for the Chinese asymmetry. Then we could uh, discuss the mechanisms in detail. But the EU should also learn how to build its offensive strategy, namely to build its advantages, not only uh, the, in the bilateral but the global context, uh, including access to uh, key uh, re, uh, raw materials such as lithium or cobalt necessary for the green transformation and uh, captured by the Chinese. Such an offensive uh, policy is something that we still have not created, in my opinion. When uh, I uh, say the EU and the minister said we, I said, hmm, it depends who you consider when you say we, because the EU is a number of uh, states. I would uh, differentiate two categories of states, uh, one uh, Italy, Germany, France, namely the countries that have very strong uh, economic relations uh, and export a lot to China, and the other uh, group of countries include Poland, Central Europe, who don't have uh, significant relations with uh, China. Our economies depend on their relationships with China uh, owing to the co collaboration with other Western economies. It is our interest when I say we, uh, Poland, and we, the Central Europe, should not uh, uh, flirt with China because it's a very dangerous strategy. We should strongly define our interests inside the EU in the relationships with China and uh, uh, take care of such interests, but it's not happening. One of such interests in the Polish context should be promoting the access to the Chinese market or fighting for the access to the Chinese market, not only for large corporations, but uh, for SMEs, because uh, this could uh, be uh, the space for collaboration also for Poland. Thank you very much. 
Let me refer to the uh, topic of uh, direct or indirect uh, dependence on the Chinese market. Our official uh, trade with China is uh, not huge, especially as far as export is concerned, but many Polish companies are subcontractors for German uh, automotive companies uh, that sell a lot to China. So. Uh, indirectly, our dependence on China is much larger than we uh, could uh, got, uh, reckon on the uh, trade statistics. Uh, the, um, Bernard Guetta, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the invitation, the second invitation, by the way, and I'm honored by that. Speaking about the relation between the European Union and China, we should first try to define what is the Chinese regime. Uh, I will uh, come back to this topic during our discussion, uh, but uh, uh, I want, I wish uh, to tell you that I uh, regard the Chinese regime uh, not only as the, big, the biggest competitor uh, for the Western democracies, but also as the biggest thre uh, threats uh, for the world uh, peace and stability. But I will come back to that. Uh, I wish now uh, first to tell you what are on my eyes the three possibilities for the European Union. Uh, in its relation with China, the three possible choices. The first one would be neutralism. And let's not be naive, it will be, and it is already, a big temptation, not only among the EU citizens, but also among the EU uh, leaders, I mean political leaders, intellectual, newspapers, uh, and so on, because a lot of people, and this is quite rational and uh, understandable, uh, do prefer uh, export and jobs than international problem, tension, and possibilities of war. Neutralism is and will be a possibility, but, but it would be a treason, of democracy, a, betray a betrayal of our values, and also a road to serfdom. The second possibility would be a full alignment on American policies. Well, it's first, it's rather usual in Europe. Uh, second, it would be also quite rational. But with two dangers, very different dangers, by the way. The first one would be to be driven into a, a kind uh, of advantage of uh, ill-advised American policies. And at the end, maybe to be driven into a real war between the two big powers of this century. The second danger would be to be betrayed, we European, by a Trump-like president, American president, which could conclude a compromise with Beijing and forget Europe, democracy, and values. So I wouldn't advise the second possibility. I wouldn't advise certainly not neutralism, but what could be the third possibility? The third possibility for Europe to, uh, would be to exist in this century. If we don't exist as a political power, we will be obliged to choose either neutralism or alignment. If we choose to exist, to exist 
as a political actor of the world stage with a common defense. A common defense, of course, inside the Atlantic Alliance. We could, uh, we could try to contain China with our American allies. And we could try to advise also our American allies to be rational and wise and to take into account our own interest. So the third possibility would be certainly my advice, my wish. It would be and it will be very difficult but precisely because it will be very difficult and rather long, we have, we got to start to exist, not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow, but tomorrow morning. Thank you. Uh, so two important dilemma highlighted uh, uh, by Mr. Guetta, uh, whether we should perceive China as a threat or an opportunity. So there are different uh, opinions uh, expressed by EU citizens and specific uh, member states. Uh, member states see it very differently uh, when it comes to opportunities uh, and threats. Uh, uh, businesses, European businesses, will probably perceive China uh, as an opportunity, but the activists who fight for human rights, they will perceive China as the threat. So uh, we have to consider whether European Union should be perceived as an actor um, which uh, will lead some politics toward China on behalf uh, of 27 member states. So these opinions are very different. These views are very different. Now I would like to give the floor to Richard McGregor, who is the last panelist of today's discussion. I'll try. I've got a bit of an echo, but I can't manage to fix that. Uh, I hope there's not too much of an echo at your end. Thank you for having me here. I wish I was with you in person in Poland. I'll just make some brief comments on a, a couple of topics that have been traversed so far. Uh, the minister talked about trying to achieve a balance uh, between uh, the US and China, the superpower competition, and a balance in relationships with China itself. Um, I can assure you that's extremely difficult to do. Uh, um, the previous speaker talked about certain options uh, for Europe with US and China, one of them being neutral. I think that's uh, almost impossible uh, going forward. Um, as far as China is concerned, uh, Europe is in play. And you can see they are competing uh, for Europe or they're competing to neutralize Europe as a US ally. Um, you may not think there is a need to make one single choice between the US and China. Um, I'm sympathetic to that. But of course, you will have to make many, many significant smaller choices uh, on issues like Huawei, uh, technology, uh, human rights, uh, Taiwan, when that comes back. So that's the first point. The second point I just want to make is to give you a, a, um, a setting of the current conditions in China. Uh, China, I mean, the Polish people obviously understand uh, communism and Leninism. Uh, it was once described to me, how does the Chinese system work? You know, China is, as a former ambassador described to me, China is not a communist country but it has a communist government. Um, but I think the longer we go on, I think the fact that you have a communist government and a committed communist, ideological communist like Xi Jinping, then the more you become a communist country as well. And that's what we see uh, unfolding before us at the moment. But China is also a remarkable success story, unlike other communist countries. 
And we are at a moment right now where China is extremely confident. This is not a new phenomenon. I would say there has been three phases of uh, Chinese confidence, which at times tipped over into hubris. Let me explain them uh, one by one. First of all, 2008, the global financial crisis. China had been taking financial advice from the United States about how to run a financial system and mitigate risk. After the financial crisis, they said to America, uh, thank you, we'll get no more advice from you on how to run a financial system because you clearly don't know how to do it yourself. So that was the first instance where China's confidence in its own system grew. Secondly, 2016, when Trump was elected, China prides itself on running a meritocratic system of government. In other words, capable people are promoted. They looked at America and said, really, you've elected this person? That's democracy? So that was a vote of confidence for them in their political system. Finally, COVID. China doesn't want to talk about how COVID started. They want to talk about how they, their system got on top of it. And if you want to lock down a country, be it 1 billion, but 1 million people or 1.3 billion people, then China has the power to do that. So on each of those occasions, after 2008, the US economy recovered, Chinese confidence wilted. After 2016, Mr. Trump actually turned out to be difficult for China to handle. He quite destabilized them. They did not know how to handle him. Their confidence wilted a little bit. Right now, uh, the US has come back a little bit uh, and China, you know, and the relationship, the competition is stabilizing once again. But look how China treats America at the moment. They will not engage on substantive issues. And you can see that by the way that uh, President Biden had to call uh, Mr. Xi in recent days to tell him to get his lower level officials to talk. Now that's pretty interesting when you think about it. China divides the world and their, their chief foreign minister has said this famously in 2010 when he was angry at Southeast Asian nations. He said to them, China is a big country, you are small countries, and that's just a fact. So if China won't, you know, feels powerful enough to disdain in dealing with the US, then you can imagine its mindset with other countries. So that brings me very briefly to Australia. Uh, now, Australia's relations with China have been all but frozen for about two and a half years. I won't go into the great, great detail, but uh, China has been angry at Australia on many issues, um, most recently on calling for a full inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. As a result, China is now exacting quite substantial trade sanctions against Australia. Now, you wonder whether if you trade a lot with China, we trade an enormous amount with China. 40% of our exports go to China. And China has attempted to cut overnight about 20 to 30% of them. Luckily for Australia, China still depends on us for many minerals. But over time, China wants to punish Australia, make Australia pay a cost, um, and uh, make other countries see that they can make us pay a cost and bring us to heel. Um, what has been most interesting, and I'll finish on this note because it's a short session, um, is that so far Australia has not wilted um, and in fact has rallied other countries to its cause. But over time we are going to pay a substantial cost and we have to rearrange our economy to manage that uh, otherwise, we have to cede sovereignty. Um, so just finally, I mean, uh, uh, you might think that um, 
you know, the US, you, you might not be interested in getting involved in the US and China uh, competition, but I can tell you that the US and China are very interested in getting you involved in their competition. This is not something you're going to be able to sit on the fence with. Uh, I'm not saying we're all going to war I'm not, or anything like that at all. I'm an, I'm, and I'm a great admirer of much of what China has achieved. Uh, but this is not going to be something people are going to be neutral of uh, in the next 10, 20 years. I'll stop there. Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo. I znowu dwa, e, dwa ważne wątki. Two important motives again. So China is ruthlessly using economic dependencies. So the more you cooperate with China, you gain profits in terms of jobs, trade, or Chinese investments in your country. But on the other hand, the risk is growing. The Chinese will use these economic dependencies. And this is what Australia, Australia case shows. And the second aspect is the aspect, uh, aspect concerning uh, the image. For many years before, it was the West uh, that uh, everybody followed. Now we have a growing positive image of China in many places throughout the world and very strong influence of China on elites in the developing countries. Just to give you an example, tens of thousands of representatives from all over the world, uh, MPs or young aspiring elite representatives are invited to Pe Beijing to take part in different trainings to learn about uh, the Chinese model. Thank you very much. The first question from me to you is as follows. If we look at the relations between Europe and China, if we look at the three levels, on the one hand, we've got relations between European Union and the European Union's uh, uh, institutions, and then the relations between national countries, and the third level, relations between China and regions and cities themselves. We have conducted a major study at the University of Łódź of all European cities with uh, more than 50,000 residents. So it shows that 50% of these European cities cooperate with China. Even more regions cooperate with China. So there are lots of ongoing local relations with China. So I would like to ask you whether the European Union will be able to address this complex uh, system of uh, uh, dependencies, whether the, Un the European Union can uh, control uh, this system. And uh, is this Possible, Minister? I cannot see a major threat. I don't think it's a problem that our MPs uh, go to China, they share experience uh, and stimulate economic exchange. We are doing this with many countries. Uh, China is one uh, quarter of the world population, so of course these, propor these proportions are bigger. I think that Chinese uh, have made uh, a catastrophic mistake when they started this uh, uh, this policy of the combating wolf. They started to attack Norway, Australia, or now Lithuania. It just made everyone aware about the nature of the Chinese political system, and in a way started anti-Chinese coalition where Australia and UK are special allies of the United States. And there is a, the whole group of countries such as Japan, South Korea, India, which is maybe of the key importance. Uh, 
And uh, these countries do not to be uh, slaves of China. China thinks that this last 200 years was a kind of abnormality. And the natural state is that China is a superpower surrounded uh, by the countries that perceive uh, China as the main culture. So this is what China is trying to do. But the world has changed. And many of these uh, countries now are formal allies of the United States. So this is a difference. The countries uh, that are democracies are not our military allies. So that's why there will be different approaches by the European Union and the United States towards China. As regards uh, the regime, China, in my opinion, is a Leninism country. So there is a monoparty country. It's not Marxism, though, because according to, to the Marxism theory, the base should determine the top. And there is a difference between Polish and Chinese communism. In Poland, communism was imposed from the outside. In China, uh, the Chinese themselves developed communism, and uh, peasants, masses of peasants, and supported uh, communism. They wanted to um, reject the feudalism. Um, China modernization happened uh, uh, under the leadership of the of the party. The true ideology of China is national nationalism and success. And we will see about this success. Economists forecast this for quite a while, but there is no history of a country that would have made such a uh, infrastructural and civilization-based uh, jump, which wouldn't lead to debts. Uh, so, so should the European Union develop such such a policy towards China, and should it do it above the member states? You say you are using the word should, and the Lis Lisbon Treaty states that we have obliged, we have made this undertaking. This only uh, the problem is that member states uh, violate this provision of the treaty. So if you read uh, these uh, provisions, you will see uh, uh, these. Um, intentions, these, uh, ob uh, these obligations. So our Minister of Foreign Affairs, he does not follow the European policy uh, in any important uh, topics, such as uh, our attitudes and approach to towards uh, uh, Russia, Iran, or China. So Poland, as an, a European country, is not benefiting from its opportunity. Uh, Poland to China is just like a small uh, uh, city town, and Germany is like a small province. This is how Chinese perceive us. China should be the final argument to foreign uh, policy, because uh, Poland has the only opportunity as a member state of the Union. So there is a question to Mr. Geta. You were quite skeptical towards the collaboration with uh, China, treating it uh, in the category of hazard risk. But uh, when we look at the global challenges such as climate change, uh, uh, fighting the poverty, pandemics, uh, economic crisis, Actually, there is no such global problem that we would be able to solve or affect it successively without collaborating with China. Isn't it so that we are simply uh, doomed for collaboration with China because there are so many common topics where we have to uh, cooperate with them? The politics and uh, specifically uh, in the international field is not a matter of manichaeism, is not a matter of black and white. We don't have to choose between having or not having relations with China. Of course, we got to have relations with such a power, economical and military power uh, also. But what kind? 
of relation. Let's not forget first that uh, trade between uh, China and the European Union is in our interest, but is also in the Chinese interest. They need us. We need them, but they need us. So we can use this balance of power, first point. Second point, uh, what is the Chinese regime? Uh, my friend uh, Radek Sikorsky just says so. Uh, the ideology of this regime is pure nationalism and a desire, and this is much more frightening, and a desire of historical revenge uh, on Western countries and Western civilization, and I would add on Western values. And this kind of regime is always frightening, but in this case, this is very frightening because the Chinese regime has every tool needed for this revenge, military, economy, technology, demography. Well, my God, this is quite a balance of power in favor of China and not in our favor. So which conclusion to draw? First, to strengthen our alliance with the United States. And I mean by that the alliance between the big democracies. But second conclusion to draw, inside this alliance, we, the European, we got to exist. We got to speak for our interest. We got to uh, tell what should be on our eyes the good policy toward China. And to be frank, um, I'm not that confident that the USA could define the best possible policy toward China when I remember what choices this, I'm sorry to say so, this nation made in the last 20 or 30 years around the globe. So I'm sorry to repeat that, but let's exist. The question for us is the very famous question to be or not to be. Thank you very much. Uh, question to Katarzyna Pałczyńska Nałęcz. In your uh, speech, you mentioned a lack of uh, balance or uh, in, in the access to the Chinese market. The European market is much more open towards uh, Chinese companies than vice versa. Uh, it was supposed to be changed by the trade uh, agreement with China and investment uh, uh, agreement with uh, China negotiated for many years and concluded uh, finally in December last year. Its uh, ratification was politically stopped uh, owing to the current uh, political tensions with China. But uh, a certain paradox occurred namely the Americans who announced a big trade war with China during Trump's uh, uh, office have better access to the Chinese market than the Europeans. In such a situation, despite our political conflicts with China, shouldn't we take care for the European interest and uh, somehow implement the agreement so as not to lose the competition with the Americans? I will answer your question in a moment, but uh, just a brief comment to the social dimension. We said that the Europeans are more concerned about the uh, trade exchange and jobs than 
uh, they are concerned about uh, conflicts and tensions uh, with China. That's true. But we should also uh, point out another dimension of the change which I mentioned and the change which took place within the last year and a half. And this is the change in awareness. Looking at the approach of the European societies to China, it has changed dramatically. In the case of such so some societies such as uh, Germany, by 30, 35 percent uh, in negative. Uh, this is a big change, and it shows that on the one hand, politics influenced the social awareness, but there is a feedback. And this is a part of the answer to the question, namely the societies are expecting a certain policy that uh, on uh, the European Union side will have the assertively symbolic dimension, namely defending the values. And if uh, uh, for defending the values, the politicians or uh, European officers are subjected to sanctions, uh, the Union responds adequately. Consequently, it all leads to a situation in which both parties are in a bad position. In the European Union, we did not manage to offset the asymmetries in the, uh, in the access to the Chinese market, but the Chinese also made a mistake. They did not appreciate the political assertiveness of the European Union, and uh, consequently, uh, the European Union uh, is more radical and uh, fast uh, and quicker approached the American policy and did not go towards the agreement, which uh, was was perceived as something dangerous and bad in Washington. So I don't want to say that this is a mistake uh, that the European Union made, but it was rather a response that couldn't be different at that uh, situation. But uh, simply, the China, uh, China did not appreciate uh, the opportunities. I do agree that there is no uh, room for neutralization. Uh, you, uh, I mean, do you? It is an illusion that the EU can remain neutral in this situation. It is not possible to cut off uh, all the contacts and uh, skip collaboration, but the point is to define the collaboration with uh, China. I would suggest the following definition. It should be the collaboration or cooperation in which the EU's dependence on China is not larger than vice versa, and we have to clearly uh, determine uh, such um, aspects uh, as so this should be like cards uh, of blackmail which could be placed on the table. This is a completely different logic of uh, cooperation, we can still call it cooperation, than the logics used uh, in the European uh, policies for decades. The EU is learning how to do it, but we are convinced that a very important part of the collaboration with China is the actual uh, political and economic uh, weight of uh, the player uh, with whom China plays and the increasing weight of uh, China in many areas uh, cannot be compensated by the EU as such. Cooperation with uh, the USA or other partners is no longer a matter of uh, uh, adapting to the uh, will of the Americans, but simply a search for collaboration which would create sufficient weight uh, technological, political, economic, economic to compensate for the Chinese weight. And that is why uh, it is necessary to cooperate with the USA for us to exist and not be only like an additive for the USA. We as the EU and uh, we as every single member state have to think uh, about the weight of responsibility and costs we are able to accept in this game in order to uh, mean something at the end of the game. 
Well, we uh, are in the same. Uh, it's no longer real to uh, consider that we are uh, with the USA, but cover no costs. We have to cover the costs, political, economic, and the same voice in the foreign policy, giving up some particular interests in the name of a larger game. All will mean nothing. And uh, just uh, Mr. Sikorsky for a while, and then uh, Richard McGregor. Just a short uh, polemics with Bernard. I don't think that we, as the European Union, should be afraid, because distance matters. In uh, regulatory uh, standard uh, economy weight, we are an equivalent empire to China on condition that we act together hand in hand we can respond um, adequately to any unpleasant situation. Even Trump's administration learned that the European Union in trade can respond to American sanctions. The country which should be really afraid of China, the country which uh, participated in the partition in China in the 19th century, and uh, contrary to the West, still ha has the fruits of such partition, is the Russian Federation. The treaty, the Beijing Treaty of uh, 1860, uh, granted Manchuria to uh, to Russia. Russia has the border with uh, North Korea and the harbor in Vladivostok on the expense of China. China pretends to uh, have forgotten it, but they do remember. When you talk about the weaknesses of the West in uh, relations with China, Russia in the Far East is even weaker than we are. But uh, I think that Russian tragedy is that its strategic interest differs from the personal interest of the Russian's leader. Putin uh, is thinking about the autocracy alliance against the West. And just a question to Richard McGregor about uh, uh, um, the perception of uh, uh, Europe by China, do they really consider Europe as a single player or as an actor which fully depends on the USA and the politics towards uh, Europe is only a part of uh, Chinese policy uh, towards the West or the USA? And by the West, or the West as such. So, how does China perceive Europe? Three minutes left, if you may. Uh, you are the biggest trading bloc in the world, which makes you an extremely valuable prize for China, for anybody. China thinks about economics strategically. You should as well, uh, much more so than um, in the past. Secondly, yes, China does consider Europe distinct. It would like you to be more distinct. In other words, it would like you to have greater distance with the United States. For example, when Europe praises Europe's strategic autonomy, I think, as Mr. Macron described it, for them that means strategic separateness from the US, no. whereas I think properly understood it would mean uh, being a, you know, a stronger uh, uh, um, combination of democratic nations. Um, so yes, China does consider you separate um, from the US. It wants you to be more separate because it thinks if you're more separate from the United States, you'll be weaker. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our panel has come to its end. I think that we haven't provided a clear answer. Uh, right now. <laughs> uh, nie daliśmy niestety takiej bardzo precyzyjnej odpowiedzi i uh, we didn't manage to give a precise answer where this balance should be in the relations with China, but it's not strange because this is a very difficult question where this balance should be found. Probably this is the biggest challenge to the European Union's foreign policy for the next uh, years. So thank you very much to the panelists and uh, thank you everyone for their attention.
It's not always easy to recognize. It may look like this. Or like this. It may be a burden. But it is a responsibility that we embrace nonetheless. But if it means this for one person, and this for someone else, maybe it ultimately means being there for one another. It isn't handed to us, but we know where to find it, and how it feels, how it tastes, and what it sounds like when we finally have it. It means different things to different people, but for many, it means everything. And if we all fight for it, it will eventually bring us together. Work is different now. We're commuting less, virtually meeting more. Separating work life and life life can feel challenging. It's easy to forget that to thrive at work, we need to take care of ourselves. Microsoft Viva Insights offers new experiences to balance productivity and well being. Personal insights help you stay at your best and most productive. Add structure to your remote workday by opting for a virtual commute, carving out time to have a productive start in the morning and mindfully disconnect in the evening. Protect time before your calendar fills up for focused work, coaching, and learning. Take regular mental breaks with Headspace, tapping into dedicated moments of mindfulness. Use emotional check-ins to tune into your day-to-day -day mindset and well-being. Strengthen team bonds with stay connected experiences that prompt you to praise collaborators, schedule one-on-ones, and follow up on pending commitments and outstanding tasks. Insights for managers and leaders offer windows into how work happens and the impact on employee well-being. Identify where teams may be isolated and take action to break down silos. Quickly discover opportunities to prevent burnout, promote coaching and development, and boost engagement. You and your team's well-being is important, especially in times of change. Taking care of one another allows you to thrive and your organization to build resilience. Experience how new well-being insights in Viva can help. Liberté Talks. To, co ważne. Seria Liberté Talks realizowana jest dzięki wsparciu Google oraz Państwa darowizną. Na podcast Podcast z Klimatem zaprasza Jakub Wiech.